What began as a protest by environmental activists at Gezi Park ended in uprisings throughout Turkey. In Turkish history, the spirit of Gezi will never disappear. Gezi marked a turning point. The government couldn't handle it. Dissident artists led the way, putting them in the sights of Recep Tayyip Erdogan and increasingly under pressure. Five artists fighting for freedom and democracy. Baris Atay. At the time, I was an actor in television. From 2013, from the Gezi protests onwards, I was unemployed. Jansu Yapidre's mother was sentenced to 18 years in jail. She's been imprisoned for a year without a shred of evidence. It's a travesty of justice. Cartoonist Tunçay Akün. It all makes me tired, but I love my work. Film star Mehmet Ali Alabora. Another world is possible. It's not a utopian dream. Sinem Sakaulu is a filmmaker. Her colleague Chida Mater received an 18-year prison sentence. Gezi Park wasn't just about the park. We were there to fight for our freedoms. Let's go back to where it all started. Gezi Park, one of the last remaining green spaces in the heart of Istanbul. In 2013, it was supposed to make way for a shopping centre. As an architect, I know how important public spaces like Gezi Park are for a society. They're places of democracy and for the future as well. So I did what I had to as an architect. I defended what is vital for our city, for Istanbul. Architects Jansu Yapıcı and her mother Michela were on the scene as soon as they heard about the demolition work. They wanted to intervene before the government could say it was a done deal. The bulldozers rolled in at night. The very next morning we went to the site looking for those responsible. Did they have a permit for their midnight operation that we weren't aware of? The excavation had already begun. Do you know how many centuries old trees were lost? The mother and daughter didn't give up. They joined forces with other environmental activists fighting the demolition. And their numbers kept growing. The police used force to try to drive them away, but eventually the protesters gained the upper hand in Gezi Park. The spirit of Gezi was born defiant and democratic. I was happy and full of hope. The idea that people from all walks of life had come together to fight for something was quite extraordinary. Of course, we knew that at some point the government and the state would intervene. Yet it was clear to me that, in any case, the spiritual revolution would leave lasting traces. People called me and said, something is happening here. You have to come. I can't right now, I said. But you absolutely must come, they insisted. So I went. I thought it would be a demonstration like any other. I never expected anything like this. In May 2013, Taksim Square, right next to Gezi Park, was a sea of people. Mehmet Ali Alabora tweeted euphorically, it's not just about Gezi Park, friend, haven't you understood? Come over, he posted. At the time, Mehmet Ali Alabora was a famous star of the stage and screen with millions of fans. So when he joined the Gezi protests, people paid attention. Gezi was a moment in which you could sense that another world is possible. 
A moment where people treat one another well and have a sense of humor. A moment in which they reveal their creativity and recognize their own power. But the reality of life was a far cry from the free society the protesters envisaged. Erdogan's Islamic and conservative course was making the country's autocratic system more repressive. Art became a tool of opposition. Artists and people in the cultural sector are the ones who need freedom the most because that's the area that's under most pressure and repressed the most in our country. Another prominent voice, musician Barış Atay, who sings about the problems in Turkey and his hopes for the future. Atay came to fame as an actor, yet since the Gezi protests in 2013, he has been offered no more roles in government-funded productions. His off-theatre productions were also subjected to close scrutiny. By trying to take away artistic freedom, you're preventing people from learning about all kinds of social realities. That's why a society without art is not a free society. Tunjai Akin is a veteran in the fight for a free society. For 40 years, he's headed the satirical magazine Le Mans with a rapier wit and courage. He looks back. Humor is the greatest weapon of the weak. It's one of the most powerful tools that can effectively disarm the strongest of opponents. Satire also allows for glimmers of freedom of expression. In contrast, much of the Turkish press has effectively been silenced in recent years. While the Gezi protests were rocking the country, Turkish television showed beauty pageants and a documentary about penguins, which is why penguins became the mascot of the protest movement. At the Gezi protests, an incredible humor resulted from this incredible collective intelligence on social media and in the slogans. And humor can help to reduce tensions between the fronts, between the resistance and the power clashing with it. Perhaps humour is a way of coping with things in our country, of dealing with our tough situation. Maybe that's why there was such a focus on humour, because at the same time we had to deal with a lot of pain. Istanbul in the summer of 2013. By now, hundreds of thousands are taking to the streets to demand their rights and the government's resignation. The pressure on Erdogan is growing by the day. We were all standing close together. Normally you notice when the police are about to use force. But this time it came out of nowhere. Suddenly they sprayed tear gas. Everyone started running around like mad, and I was all on my own. <laughs> I really thought I was going to die. The situation escalated. Protests and violent clashes with the police took place across Turkey. Frustrated with Erdogan's decade-long rule, millions of demonstrators rose up against his autocratic style of government and his right-wing populist AK party. The mood was extremely tense in Turkey. Erdogan wanted to implement bans on alcohol and pressure women to have at least three children. This pressure on women and the constant demands made by both the Prime Minister and the government were all reasons behind the Gezi protests. Gezi Park wasn't just about the park. Every tree we protected symbolized a woman being able to walk around the streets on her own at night, or being able to openly express dissenting opinions. 
We were there to fight for our freedoms, for our lives to be free from interference. A tide of rage flooded the streets, bringing with it a new self-confidence. We're here. Where are you? Demonstrators demanded of Erdogan. He remained impassive. Allah aşkına soruyorum. Tayyip Erdoğan diktatörmüş. Yani bu millete hizmetkar olan bir insana eğer diktatör yakıştırmasını yapıyorlarsa buna ben diyecek bir şey. His words were followed by even harsher repression. More than 5,000 demonstrators were arrested, including Jansu and Michela Yapıcı. We were detained for four days. They made us strip naked, then searched us. I was acquitted, but my mother was tried in court on charges of leading a terror organization. She was found not guilty, but we were in and out of court over the next 10 years. I'm absolutely exhausted, but I still have hope, even if I must die now. Gezi marked a turning point for Turkey. Gezi is a milestone, because the government couldn't handle it. Six people were killed and 8,000 injured. Dozens were blinded by tear gas. The utopia of summer 2013 came to a bitter end. Meanwhile, the government was looking to punish and intimidate those responsible. Turkey was deeply divided. Dialogue between Erdogan supporters and his opponents was impossible. Erdogan singled out individuals to blame for the Gezi protests. He publicly denounced Mehmet Ali Alabora's tweet. There was more. The government suggested Alabora's 2012 play, Mi Mineur, about a dystopian society and its absurd mechanisms of control, rehearsed the uprising and amounted to a guide to a revolution. No coincidence, read the front page of the pro Erdogan paper, Yeni Shafak. Several visits he had made to Egypt were also deemed suspicious. For the government, surefire proof he had met with Arab Spring activists to gain know-how for a revolution in Turkey. They said I came back to Turkey to train young people in revolution with this play, so I've been preparing for the Gezi protests for a long time. The allegations put Alabora in danger. He made a public statement questioning if a play could trigger the protests of millions and made light of the absurd accusation. I said, I'd like to thank you for believing the theatre has so much power and that a revolution could be started from the stage and get so many people on the streets. I was being sarcastic, but maybe there's a grain of truth in there, too. Perhaps we theatre people really underestimate ourselves. Barış Atay also became a government target. In the autumn of 2013, he was arrested under suspicious circumstances. He was released after three days, but the threat remained. Charges, fines and an attack on a public street. The artist was subjected to clear intimidation. Things never really settled down after Gezi. There was never a moment that we could catch our breath. Social upheaval and protest events continue in Turkey. Even today, one thing leads to another and triggers new counter-movements. In his 2015 work, Only a Dictator, Atay examines the tools a dictator uses, an artistic reflection of the upheaval in the country, dissecting and questioning its system of repression.
We don't just want to talk about Erdogan. That would be too superficial and too much like propaganda. These mechanisms are in action all over the world, not just in Turkey. How is the dictatorship established? What elements and parameters are typical of dictatorships? How does the dictator view the people of his country? The peace was successful, too successful. It was banned in Turkey on the grounds the play could disturb public order and security. Wherever we look, there's hardly any more opposition in the performing arts. Not in film, the stage, nowhere from where you could reach the public. There's no opposition left. Filmmaker Chidam Mater also has to struggle for her films to reach the public. Obstacles are constantly placed in her path. Now she's behind bars, her friend is continuing her work. There is state support for the arts in Turkey, but the bodies awarding funding are pro-government. Like all other independent filmmakers, Chidam is looking for other ways to finance her work, such as sponsoring or co-production from abroad. The satire magazine Le Man is also fighting for its survival. When a military coup attempt in 2016 shook the country, the magazine implied Erdogan was to blame for the bloody events. Erdogan was not amused. He called publicly for punishment. The people were mobilized. They came here to storm our offices. They came with weapons. The police stopped the mob in front of the building just in time. But the warning hit home. All the copies of that edition were confiscated and collected from the shops, newsstand by newsstand. They opened criminal files on us in all of Turkey's provinces and districts. The stack reached to the ceiling. All of them filed charges against us because of this cover. A climate of fear blanketed the country. Independent thinking could land people in serious trouble, all the more so if those thoughts were expressed aloud. Opinions could be labelled as false statements, a criminal offence. But is silence an option? That depends on the individual. But the actual problem with self-censorship is really down to the government having spread so much fear that it doesn't even have to keep exerting pressure. I don't think there is anything we wouldn't have drawn. There was nothing we wouldn't have written about for years. But with the new young colleagues joining us now, I see this fear. They worry that they will get into trouble. That really makes me sad. Bookstores selling the work of critical thinkers are few and far between. Oppositional directors in the arts and media are being replaced, dissenting artists taken to court. The fear of arbitrary arrests is everywhere. Since the Gezi protests, dissidents like Michela Yapadje, Jansu's mother, have been put on trial time and time again. You go through a whole spectrum of emotions. It's extremely stressful. But at some point, you become indifferent. Life goes on. Going to court becomes routine. Other revolutionaries of the Gezi protests who are repeatedly put on trial include, most prominently, Osman Kavala, businessman and patron of the arts. Charged with financing the Gezi protests, the sentence, life imprisonment. 2017 saw him put behind bars. Michela Yapidje was at the scene at every single trial protesting. Trial, arrest, release, retrial, 
a grueling cycle. We were no strangers to the idea of prison. But until now, we had only ever known it as outsiders through the stories we had heard. That was until her mother was sentenced. After several trials, the judiciary bowed to political pressure. She and seven other activists from the Gezi protests were sentenced to 18 years. A show trial and a shock for civil society. Michela Yapidja exited the courtroom singing, I will survive. Joining her behind bars was filmmaker Chida Matir, convicted for a film about the Gezi movement, a film she never made. She had traveled from abroad for the trial, trusting that the charges would not be legally tenable. Why were these eight people singled out? Why Cheetah? We don't know the answer. Nobody knows. I read the documents, thousands of pages of documents, and I honestly couldn't find any unifying point, because there isn't one. There is simply no basis on which these people were selected. It was a clear attempt to undermine the power of the Gezi movement to rewrite the narrative. Gezi was a popular movement in Turkey. 10 million people took to the streets. But branding it a criminal scheme of an organized movement, that makes it easier to intimidate people and ultimately make them back down. Behind bars, Chidam Mater sends letters to her friend Sinem Sakaulu with instructions for her films. She, for one, refuses to be silenced. Chidam's sentencing was met with shock and dismay in the film world. Cannes, Venice and Berlin held solidarity rallies. We made sure that Chidam hears about this wave of solidarity, even in prison. She's really glad about the support from the film world. She told us, it's like watching your funeral while you're still alive. A similarly harsh sentence would also await Mehmet Ali Alabora were he to return to Turkey. He lives in exile in the UK. I left Turkey in September 2013, partly because I was afraid for my life. And that was not an unfounded fear. But there was also another reason. There was simply no more scope for me professionally in Turkey, no more scope for creativity, no more air to breathe. So I left my home. Countless Turkish artists are now living in exile, much to the detriment of the country's arts and culture. Alabora is trying to start afresh in Britain, but has had to go back to square one in his career. First off, I had to learn to act in a foreign language. I speak English, but I don't relate to the words in the same way. I'd never used English to express myself emotionally. Like when you suffer a loss, when a relative of yours dies, when you say I love you, or when you are angry. He has since regained his footing and recently even starred in a BBC television series. And he's an outspoken supporter of refugees. I am a refugee. You may be a refugee. And very soon you may be a refugee anywhere in the world just because of the climate crisis. He fends off homesickness with his project Istanbul Elsewhere. At pop-up gatherings, attendees discuss what it means to come from Istanbul. The group hosts events worldwide, both in person and online. The support group keeps the Turkey he loves alive. Barış Atay has taken a more direct approach. He has left acting behind to challenge Erdogan directly through politics. We agreed that as a political figure within the art community, I should start taking on more responsibility in politics itself. <laughs> In 2018, he refounded the Workers' Party of Turkey, advocating for minorities and denouncing the government's disaster response after the earthquake. Especially for the younger generation, Barış Atay is a beacon of hope. Although we are all different, we find common ground. We are not homogenous, but we take action together. 
I think that is what the government is most afraid of. A tie rarely appears on stage these days. His recent charity concert in Cologne was an exception to raise money for earthquake victims while making a political stand. He no longer has time for theater. Do I regret it? No. I don't regret anything I've done. But now the field of art is empty, even though art is such a powerful tool of opposition. But what of Gezi Park itself? The shopping mall was never built. Most of the trees still stand. But it gets cordoned off at every opportunity to make sure the spirit of Gezi never returns. Still, the civilian population was emboldened by the movement. The Gezi Park protests left a lasting legacy. Do you think art is an effective tool for resistance? Let us know in the comments.